Yes. Yeah, so right in there, right yeah. in that little clearing. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. All right. Yeah. All right, Gordon. What are you doing with with the with the compass there? Well, we just the the main thing is um, when we set up the temperature tower, which is the first thing we have to set up. I have to make sure that the baskets that are protecting the sensors from the sun are facing north. So where's north? Behind me. Okay. So yes, yeah, so north is facing that way. So the baskets that are protecting here are to the north because why? Because you don't. You don't want direct sunlight on the sensors. So you're, when you're doing ambient temperature monitoring, you don't want you want them out of direct sunlight, and you want good airflow because you're trying to measure the ambient air. So okay. you want airflow all the way around. Okay, and, and it's the north because it's a winter eclipse. It's just north because well, Mac, it's a spring Mac, eclipse. yeah. Well, max eclipse for us is going to be at about 180 degrees south. Okay. So I've set up this poles, the poles, so the baskets face north. Okay. That that's why. Okay, got it. Yeah. And this is all. These are all your gadgets. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a ton of stuff. <laughs> you built all this? Yeah. <laughs> I love how much Gordon loves eclipses. That's why we're talking to Gordon. What is this one? So, here's the deal. When, um, when you want to do some of these shadow effects, you're, you see, if you do a shadow effect like this, the sun's going to be at 60 degrees during the eclipse. And if you have a white sheet on the ground, you've added all these angles to doing the shadow effects. Right. So I made these stands to hold these to be in the plane of the sun. Oh. Because when, when the people do these effects, in the field where we're observing, we want to not add angles. We want it to be clean. Got it. So you want to be orthogonal to the solar rays. You want to be 90 degrees to the sun. It's, yes, as best as you can. That's yes. exactly right, in the plane. And so when I was doing, you know, my first sharp and fuzzy shadow experiments, the one I did in 2017, I was just doing it with a sheet on the ground. Yeah. And that eclipse is about 60 degrees too, so it added angles. And then, when I did it in 2019, I had a, a little mini tripod that I could change the altitude three times. So I moved it with the eclipse as the eclipse was setting. But this year, we're going to track it. So what we're going to do for Sharp and Fuzzy Shadows this year <laughs> is we're going to motorize it and um and track it so this will track the sun and will be completely in the plane of the sun and watch the shadows change i i tested this at the annular and it worked great oh great oh golly <laughs> this is amazing uh, you're not playing around this time man oh no we're killing it because we can drive you can't take this stuff if you're doing it internationally Oh man. Do you ever think to yourself, maybe this is a little too much? I do. <laughs> hey, what is your answer to that? I still do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just like. As, as long as my wife will tolerate it, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is this? So, we're, this pole is going to be 20 feet tall. And we're going to take temperature data at, at ground level. Okay. How can I help you? I'm good. I'm good. And then 10 feet and then 20 feet. You made all this? Yeah. So I have to make it so I could get it in the truck, you know, to drive it to our observing site. Why do you have your ropes and bags? Because it's too hard to keep them sorted out. Oh, clever. And that's the top of the probe? Yeah. And so you see, these will protect oh, and you made, the sensor, right? They'll you made this out of duct work. Correct, yeah. 
So they'll protect the little sensor that's going to hang in here. I have my four sensors armed. We're going to take data today. They're running right now. Uh -huh. And so this will be facing north. So you see, it'll be out of the sun. Okay. Oh, but I see. But airflow has to have airflow. Oh, so you only want convection, no radiation. Correct. Ah. Oh. And that's why you bring up a great point. That's why the bottom probe has a protector towards the ground. You don't want reflected radiant energy off of the ground. So you protect that one on the bottom. Ah. How many eclipses have you seen? Five. Five? Yeah, this would be six. What was the best one for you? You know, that's a great question. A, a lot of people who interview people who've been to multiple eclipses ask that. And the answer is always kind of the same. The first one's always great, obviously, but it's so overwhelming, you don't remember a lot of the details. And then each one is different. I mean, they just are. Every one's great. And every one, and we're going to talk about it later, every one you come up with a different thing that was great about it. Every eclipse is different. What you experience, what your sensations are about what's going on. So. Unfortunately, you do have to go to multiple ones to kind of get it all in, and then unfortunately that makes it international, but that's what I do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hear my cricket? You're, you're faking a cricket? No, this is for the animal behavior station. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean? You'll see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you, like, what's interesting about you, Gordon, is you're self-aware. Like, you, you know this is over the top. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you do it anyway. <laughs> so the thing is, Destin, we have a great opportunity where we're observing, because we're going to be in a field with our group of people, and then about three or four hundred other people that are going to be at this facility. And, you know, a lot of people are not going to take the time or don't know where to get resources, you know, to learn about this stuff. And that's fine. I know everybody's not as into it as I am. But if I can set this stuff up the morning of the eclipse and have people just walk through these stations, which will just take 10 or 15 minutes, they're going to get so much more out of that day. Do uh -huh. you understand? It, yeah. that's, that's why we have a great opportunity to drive this stuff to our observing position, set it up in the morning. The eclipse starts like at one o'clock. So they'll have, I'll be up early, obviously, and they'll have four or five hours to go through these stations. It's going to be, a, it's going to be great for them. So that's, that's kind of why I wanted to make this video. When you showed me this stuff, I was like, I want everybody to know this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I just want them to see th this is the weird stuff that happens only during that small period right, of time. Right, exactly. And again, everybody is not going to study it, and that's okay. But we can briefly give them the overview, and they'll just ha get so much more out of the day. Yeah, that's cool. This is really important. So I have a little jig set up to erect the temperature tower. You want to help me line this up? Yeah. So take that stake, that silver stake, uh -huh. and we just have to get this lined up north-south. So move that way. More, pull it taut. Uh, right there is good. Push it in the ground right there. Okay, good. All right. Is that north-south? Yeah. Okay. So that's your datum. We fixed east and west. Uh, yeah, we're ready to, to stand it up. <laughs> it's jiggly. <laughs> that was funny. All right. Cool. All right, now. I'm going to stay... I'm going to hold the pole, is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to let you sort strings. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were trying to be neater than this. <laughs> oh. Man, I was, this was supposed to be smoother. You know what makes me laugh is the thought of you yeah, yeah. doing math at your house, <laughs> trying to perfect, because I know you're a perfectionist. Trying to perfect this 10 seconds of 
making this pole go up. And it, it's supposed to be easier, I assure you. I... <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't too bad. I, we, we just, no, it was great. We got the south one um, a little bit crooked. It's still a little crooked at the top, but it won't affect it for today. It's actually not that bad. No, it's actually great. Okay. So I think I don't, I don't think we need to change anything. You've done an excellent job. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. Today, I have a special treat for you. So as you know, on April 8th, 2024, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. That's when the moon passes in front of the sun, and it's just an amazing natural phenomenon. I, I've seen a solar eclipse, and it blew my mind. Here's a little video of when that happened in 2017. Three, two, what? That is crazy. Take your glasses off. Oh my God. Take your glasses off. That is bizarre. Stars. Oh wait, get a, it's an overhead sunset. This is my friend, Dr. Gordon Telepin. And one of my favorite things about Gordon is that he genuinely loves eclipses. Not a little bit, like all the way. He all the way loves eclipses. And uh, I'm gonna be watching the eclipse with Gordon. So what you want to do, if you've never heard of a total solar eclipse, what you want to do is there's this path of totality that goes up from Mexico through Texas all the way up the, all the way to Canada. You want to get into that path of totality because there you will actually see the total solar eclipse. If you're outside of that, you won't see the total solar eclipse. You'll see a partial eclipse. But today, Gordon has set up these stations to explain some of the science that you get to see during what's called the partial phase phenomenon. Now, the partial phase phenomenon is all the time leading up to the eclipse. Like, if you were to imagine you have the sun and you have the moon passing in front of the sun, that's kind of what it looks like, you have several contact times. Now, contact time C1, that's when the lunar disk touches the solar disk. C2 is when you begin the total solar eclipse. That's when the moon covers the sun. C3 is when it exits the sun. And C4 is when the edge of the moon exits the sun completely. That's called the contact times. One of the cool things about Gordon is he created an app. And this app is called the Solar Eclipse Timer. And what it does is while you're at the eclipse, hopefully you're on the path of totality, if you'll just have your phone set up to the Solar Eclipse Timer app, Gordon's voice will talk you through all of these times and tell you what to do and what to look at during the eclipse. And I'm not like trying to sell Gordon's app because I want Gordon to like make money on his app. I'm trying to tell you about his app because it genuinely improves the experience. I did it at, uh, at Wyoming the first time, and I also did it in Argentina. Okay, are these the only two lenses you have to take off? Hands on camera filters. <laughs> <laughs> it's just for you, babe. There you go. 20, remove camera filters. Okay, got it. 15. Come on, babe. Observe the planets and stars. Oh, how cool. What? And so I didn't know what a total solar eclipse was until this man told me about it. He just said, trust me, it'll blow your mind. And he was right. Gordon. Yes, sir. All right, you got all this stuff set up, right? Yeah, we're ready. Okay, so here's here's a question to start. Yeah. Why is this, is a solar eclipse amazing? Like, why should people see it? Um, the astronomy of it is that you can physically watch the clockwork of the solar system. You know, nobody goes out and watches the moon for an hour. It's moving up there, but you don't stand there and watch it for an hour to see it shift relative to any landmark. But in an eclipse, you're watching the clockwork of the solar system. The moon is physically 
moving from west to east and you have the sun as the reference point you can see it moving over the sun and then on top of that the earth is rotating so everything that's happening is setting to the west so it's a way to see the solar system in action and then of course there's all the science and the thrill of it getting dark in the afternoon and seeing the beautiful corona and then if you're a photography geek trying to image all of it under time pressure. Now, now when, you, when you told me this the first time, we met in, in Dr. Telepin's office before I knew anything about eclipses, and you tried to explain to me the emotions. Mm -hmm. I didn't get it. I totally didn't get it. Right. And people don't get it, do no, they? No, you have to do one. You have to do one. And so the important thing about this eclipse, April 8th, 2024, is the next one that crosses the continental United States is 2045. Okay. So, so you got to hit this you, one. You got to get this one. Otherwise, you're traveling internationally. Okay. Got it. And so what, what would you say to somebody that's like, they've heard about it. They're like, okay, I think I want to do the eclipse. My, you know, my uncle is talking about going and I'm on the fence. What would you say? You got to go. You, you have to go. So you got to remember, if you're in the path, you're in totality. You want to get towards the center line because that's the bigger... Um, radius, I guess, or the bigger chord of the circle, right? So you're, if you're in the center part of the circle, you have more time in totality. But if you're at the edge of that path, it, if, even if you're at a 99% eclipse, you don't get totality. It'll never get that brilliant corona. It'll never get dark. You will see some things like the temperature changing and the lighting changing and things like that. But I mean, if you're going to get to the edge of the path, get into the path, no, no matter what it takes. Okay. So, so if you're on the fence about getting in your car and driving five hours to get into the path of totality, just do it yeah. and try to get as close to the center line as you can. If you're out even 1%, you totally missed it. Out of the path. You don't have to be exactly on the center line. I mean, within 10 miles of the center line would be fine. Okay. It'd be fine. You lose a few seconds of totality. It's not a big deal. So don't freak out if you're like not... Not right on the line. That's okay. Exactly right. That's good. How big is the path of totality? You know, that's a good question, and I think the width of this umbra is about 120 miles. I don't remember the exact number. In 2017, it was about 71 miles. Oh, wow, that's big. It's bigger, and that's, how, that's why you have a bigger total, longer totality time, because the circle's bigger. How long is totality in this eclipse? So in the southwest, in Texas, where we're going to be, which is really close. I'm going to be with you this time. That's exactly right. Yeah. Next, the point of greatest eclipse is in Mexico. So that's where the longest duration always is. But that's just in, in the middle of Mexico. So we're really close in Texas. So our totality time will be over four minutes. And then it stays over four minutes halfway through Indiana. So half of the country has a four minute totality. And then it exits Maine a little over three minutes long. So it's a really long eclipse. And you have to put this into perspective too. The absolute longest eclipse you can have on Earth, if everything was perfect, the moon is as big as it can be in the sky, the sun is as far away as it can be in the sky, you're on the equator, you can have an eclipse that's seven minutes and 31 seconds. Wow. So having a four minute eclipse that you do not have to travel to internationally is a huge deal. It's special. It's really special. It's special and it's not gonna happen for another 20 something years. That's exactly right. Okay, so before we do all this, I have to preface this. Gordon is a little crazy about eclipses. Like you absolutely love them. <laughs> I do. He's also self-aware. He re you realize that you go a little over the top. Yeah, uh, no, I don't have to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you don't have to admit that. That's absolutely right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about what's called, it's your favorite thing, the partial the, the phase. The partial phase phenomena. Okay. So the, the thing about it is everybody thinks an eclipse is only about totality. But there are a lot of interesting things happen because the moon's moving in front of the sun. And it's a physical blocker of all of the electromagnetic energy of the sun, right? So picture yourself in a bright room with no windows and you're the only person in the room and there's a lot of lights and there's a guy controlling a dimmer switch and he can dim the lights to that room over an hour and a half. That's what an eclipse is. So you get all these really great lighting effects. You get all these great thermodynamic effects because the radiant energy to the earth is decreasing. And if people learn about this, they'll really enjoy the partial phases. And then it's interesting for the kids to do. It's hard to keep kids 
entertained for an hour and a half while they're watching the partial phases. But if you get them interested in, in this science, they can do basic temperature logging, they can do sharp and fuzzy shadows and pinhole projection, they're going to have a great time. That's awesome. Okay, so to be clear, you don't have to care about all this stuff that Gordon and I care about. You'll still have fun, but you should care about it. Well, they can learn about it and they could do 10% of this setup and, and get the enjoyment out of it. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so before we set up one of these thermocrons at six inches above the ground, 10 feet above the ground, and 20 feet above the ground, mm -hmm. and they're gonna have good air circulation, and right now they're on, they're monitoring the temperature. But what you need is you have to understand what the ground is doing because the ground is what's absorbing the energy not the air and that's what's creating on our ambient temperature so for this eclipse these are on the north side but on the south side we're going to put a thermocron on the ground as like a boundary condition yeah well it's what's absorbing the radiant energy and we want to simulate being just a little bit under soil. You don't want it black. You don't want to cheat. You know, you want it to kind of behave like dirt. Like, like dirt, yeah. There's a little bit on this side that's not covered. Okay. We just want a little bit. That got it. Yeah. Just like that. Looks Perfect. Great. Perfect. So that's on the south side, and you can feel the heat mm -hmm. in your hand from the yeah. sun. That's going to be changing. That's taking a, a data point every minute. So that's going to start changing. Oh, interesting. All right. These are how many stations you've got here? Eight stations. So these are stations that you've created to explain the partial phase phenomena. Correct. Okay, well, to explain what happens during them. Yeah, the science of the partial phase phenomena, because there's a lot going on. And we want the people who are enjoying the eclipse with us that day, if they haven't done this research, to enjoy it. So yeah. I made up these educational stations that we're going to set up in the field where we're set up for the other people to come and look at and read the posters and understand what's going on. All right, so let's look at this first one here. What is this? So this is temperature logging. I've logged temperature at a lot of eclipses. I, I did it in 2002. I did it in 2017, but I, I messed it up because I used a temperature data logger that had too much thermal mass. Okay. So it did not respond to the temperature changes quickly enough. And, uh, and then in 2019, I did it with a new thermocron, just about waist level, and got a temperature drop of 26 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot for an eclipse. But that just had to do with that winter eclipse, a low ecliptic, um, so we, uh, very calm conditions, we didn't have a lot of air mixing, so we really had a drop in temperature. Okay. In 2002, I had about a 9 degree Fahrenheit temperature drop. Okay. So at the annual eclipse, I tested this system with two thermocrons, one at ground level and one at 8 feet, just to see if I would see a difference even at the annual, and, and I did. The, the data was really interesting. So what I want to do at this eclipse, since I can drive to Texas and I can bring all this gear, I'm going to put up this temperature tower and we're going to monitor temperature at ground level because that's where the energy from the sun is getting delivered to create our ambient temperature. The air doesn't uh, absorb radiant energy. And then we're going to monitor the temperature at six inches. That's what this is? That's right. Okay, and that's just a little thermocouple that's logging every minute. That's right. And then how high is the second one? The second one's at 10 feet. And what's the last one? At 20 feet. So why do you have them? And then you have this other one that's covered up in the dirt here. Right. So that's the one that's actually being warmed by the sun right now. So what will happen if this works, the morning of the eclipse when we set this up, the sun will be rising just like it is now. And that temperature logger will, will increase its temperature. Then when the partial phases start, that's going to start cooling then after oh because the solar loading is going down exactly. because the solar disk is covered correct okay yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna document decreasing radiant energy to the ground then totality will happen now sometimes it's really interesting 
the temperature drops a little bit after totality, there's a little lag. So it can get cooler after totality, even when the sun's coming back. And then there's a little lag for the thermal warming. So between C3 and C4, that's going to start to increase in temperature again. So, so we're going to so get this nice, the, smooth... The mass of the dirt? So... so it, it's like a flywheel. It's kind of s spinning down and then it spins back up. It takes a little while for the for the ground to reheat. Okay. It takes a little, and, and then there's a little extra cooling because the thermal energy has not been there for the whole time of totality. Okay, so you have that actually indirect solar loading. You have this one. You have a reflector on it so right. that the sun can't hit it. So this is just convective heating. Right, and it's facing north. You see it's in the shade, but it has great air circulation. So basically... The sun is heating up the dirt, and the dirt, the, the heat is rising, and, and that's where this is getting its heat. That's a great question. So this one's a little more complicated. You want to have good air circulation because you're trying to monitor the air flowing around six inches above the ground. But you're right, the, the soil underneath this monitor is also getting heated. So on this monitor, we have a reflector on the ground side to try to prevent radiant energy from coming up into the sensor. We don't have that at 10 feet and 20 feet because you don't need ah, it there. I see that, okay. Yeah. Okay, and so if everything goes perfectly, what do you hope to see here? So, if we have calm conditions, not a lot of wind and a lot of natural air mixing, what should happen is the ground sensor should decrease in temperature before the 20-foot sensor. We should have a 20-foot inversion layer for seconds or minutes. I don't know. It, it's going to depend on the ambient wind, right? So they will lag. That will move faster than the 20-foot one. That's what I want to try to document, the little inversion layer. And then after totality, the opposite will happen. The ground sensor will start heating and the 20-foot sensor will lag. So it will stay cooler. So what is the takeaway for people that will be at the eclipse? What, what will they, what well, can they observe? They will not be able to observe this, but they will be observed the decrease in temperature. There's no question about it. And remember, my app is going to remind you to do that. It, there's three points in the partial phases where the app will say observe for temperature changes. Because a lot of people are not really aware of it until they sit back and they say, hey, you know what? It does feel like it's getting cooler. So sometimes you need that little nudge to, to think about it because you're busy on Eclipse Day. So the first station... Temperature inversion. Right, and there's one other thing on here. So this is a little light sensor. I like to monitor the ambient light of the observing position where we're going to be set up, okay? So this is gonna monitor the lux change between C1 and C2, just white light decrease in lux. At, at just a little bit above ground level. So I've done these on camera tripods before, and what I have is I have these little blips in the data where people walk in front of it. So I wanna get this a little higher so we don't have people walking in front of it. So I'll even mount it a little higher on the eclipse. So this is the ambient white light meter. This little port is a color port meter. So that's- Oh, that's ambient white light. Right, that's and color. that's color. So that's monitoring the percentage change of blue, green, and red. The sun is really big and bright, and it, it's a different color at the limb. It gets redder at the limb because the sun is a big sphere. So as the photosphere goes around the sun, some of that light has to go through photosphere to get us to get to us. Yep. So it makes it dimmer. So there's a natural limb dimming. dimming. Just like a sunset, as it goes down, the, the lower it goes, the more red it is because it has to go through the to... Earth's atmosphere. Similarly, on the sun, it has to go, like if I'm looking directly at the center of the sun, that light has to go straight out through it's corona. just straight. Well, it's basically straight. So I think it's about 6,000 Kelvin in the middle. And then it drops to about 5,500 Kelvin at the edge. It gets redder. During an eclipse, in that last five minutes, we are bathed in more red light because we are only lit by the limb. It's amazing. And it's part of what makes that eerie lighting Okay. I have data. It's amazing. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so you're actually going to see on the RGB sensor here, you're going to see more red light. Yes. The red light's going to bump up. And it's actually a percentage. 
the red light's going to go, go up and the blue-green goes down. And so I'll have two of these. This one's going to be for the observing area. And then I'm going to have one mounted on a tracking camera that's going to be pointing at the sun for the, for the whole time. I did that in 2019. The data was amazing. I would have never thought to do that. That's genius. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's go to let's go to the next station. Next station. So uh, the next station is the concept the concept of pinhole projection, or camera obscura, if you're doing a pinhole camera. So light rays have to travel in a straight line. So if you have something that makes a pinhole, light at the top of the sun has to go through the holes as a straight line, and light at the bottom of the sun has to go through those holes as a straight line, but they cross because the sun is not a point source. It's, it's an extended source of light. So there's a top and a bottom of those light rays. So when those light rays go through this hole, the top ones are crossing and going to the bottom. The bottom ones are crossing and going to the top and the left and right are flipped. So right now we have a full sun, so we're seeing round disks. But during the crescent phases, these will be crescents but they'll be reversed left to right. Now you can't really see it in a crescent because it's not a picture, so you don't have a lot of orientation. But there is one thing you can see. During totality, depending on the way you're, where you're positioned, the crescents will be a banana in one direction. And after totality, they'll flip. There'll be a, a, a banana in the other direction. So people need to grab a colander. A colander is a great thing to bring. Or a, a, a cheese grater. Cheese grater. Not a zester, has to be a cheese grater. <laughs> <laughs> and joking. then a, a fun thing to do is make up little signs. Okay. So total solar eclipse. And so you can, oh, that's cute. How long have you been doing this? Like uh, making little signs oh, I've like that? Done it. I, I, I probably didn't do it at my first eclipse, but I've done it since then. Really? Yeah. That's adorable. Did, yeah. You made this by hand. Yeah. That's Here you go. great. I love that you're just unapologetic. Like, this is awesome and you should do it. <laughs> this is great. Oh, you made one for me. Yeah. Thank you. Smarter every day. Look at that. Thank so, you, Gordon. Well, yeah, you're welcome. And so we'll see the crescents flip from left to right. Okay. The other thing about pinhole projection is making a pinhole projection shoebox uh -huh. so that you can, uh, kids can observe the sun safely. So what you do is you get a shoebox and you cut a square in the top uh -huh. and you, you really need a pinhole so you tape a little tin foil over it and you poke it with a little pin. Uh -huh. Then on the back of the box tape some white paper, Okay. make a little viewing port on the side and then it's hard to do but if we get that lined up with the sun, we, there. That little bitty dot right there. Yeah. So that's pinhole projection of the sun, and during the eclipse, that will be a crescent. That's fun. That's simple, isn't it? Oh, it's great for kids during the partial phases. When I was at uh, the most recent uh, partial eclipse, uh -huh. I grabbed some trash or a cup out of, uh -huh. the, of the trash can, uh -huh. and I just poked a hole in it, and yeah. I went around showing yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. so excited. I know it's great. <laughs> so let's talk about these white um, these white fabrics. You asked me before why they're slanted. And the reason is, if you're doing pinhole projection on something that's white on the ground like that, and the sun's at 60 degrees, you introduce angles to those little pinholes, because even paper has a thickness to it. So then the, the picture that you'll see becomes more blurry. So what I did for our stations, I made those little stands to hold these to be in the plane of the sun, so that when people do it at our site, they just have a better experience. They get crisper pictures. Awesome. I guess the takeaway for people at an eclipse is if you're somewhere, and let's say there's a, can you hold this for a second? Yeah, sure. It just pointed at me. So like if you're somewhere and there's like a, a white vehicle, like you want to, you want to, yeah. or a white wall, you want to position it so that it's 90 degrees to the sun, basically. Is that it? Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then that's when And you then you'll have a nice flat plane to do your pinholes and they'll just be cleaner. You'll get better pictures. That's awesome. Okay. What else All right. you got? So this is another station that has to do with how the partial phases change the way light reaches Earth, um, which is fascinating. So, as I said before, the sun is a big globe of light. So, light rays from that huge globe 
come to us at an infinite amount of directions. I mean, so light rays that's starting on the east are going to the west, and light rays that are starting the west going to the east, just infinite, up and down, all across, right? But during an eclipse, after about a 50% eclipse, the light rays in line with the crescent reach the earth more linearly. They actually get a direction because now the, the banana is not an extended source of light when you're in line with it, but it's an extended source of light Left when you're 90 right. degrees to it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. So I made up these stations for people. What they're going to do during the eclipse, they're going to get this board and they're going to rotate it slowly. And these are at 90 degrees to each other. And what they're going to find, oh, let me get out of line. I'm seeing it. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically, the uh, so right now the edges of the shadow are fuzzy. They're all fuzzy. They're all fuzzy because the sun's a big globe of light. But during the eclipse, what's going to happen is when they rotate this, the one that gets sharp edges is going to be in line with the crescent, and the one that's 90 degrees will be fuzzy edges still. So if we were to combine the colander station with this by putting a little hole in this. You could do that. If we were to do that, can you hold this back up please? Yeah. What would we see if, if we saw the banana? We had the banana or we had a hole here and we right. saw a banana, banana there. Yeah. The the sharp shadow would be That's a great idea. We should do that. Okay. We should have put a hole in one of these. Now so I didn't do I didn't do pinhole with wood because it's too thick. Okay. And it creates a lot of distortion. It creates edge distortion. Ah, so maybe you could put some aluminum so, foil. Well, so I'll make a 90 degree uh, station. For this station, I'll make a 90 degree demonstration thing out of something really thinner with a hole in it. And you're right, when, they, when they're in line with the crescent, they'll get a sharp shadow and the crescent will be pointing in the, in the same direction. That's, That's an excellent point. I hadn't thought of that. So here's the other thing. You're going to see pictures on the internet prior to this eclipse of peeping, people making shadows. And they're just going to take pictures of them and they're going to, sh they're going to, they're going to submit them to social media and they're going to say my shadows were weird or my shadows were sharp or I didn't know what was going on with my shadows because they don't know what's going on. So, and after the eclipse, you're going to see people posting pictures of shadows. I want them to know what's going on. I want them to know. So at the annular, I did a movie of this. I had my hand out uh, perpendicular to the crescent and then I rotated my arm to be in line with the crescent and the shadows got sharp. So that's what they should do at, at the eclipse. If they're going to take a picture, document why you're doing it and what direction the sun is and when you're taking it and stuff like that. So maybe that's why it feels so weird is because it's blurry on one side and sharp on the other. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of the reasons that the last part of an eclipse is so interesting. It's one of the lighting effects that makes it so eerie. Yeah, that's amazing. So the other thing to do is do it with your hand. I mean, doing hand is great because you'll have parts of your hand that will be fuzzy because they'll be 90 degrees and you'll have other parts of your fingers, you know, that will be, um, will be sharp because they're going to be in line. So you recommend people taking a, a selfie during the sharp, sharp and fuzzy shadows? If they turn their flash off, Okay. <laughs> Remember, flash photography is a big no-no on Eclipse Day. And why? You don't want to ruin people's dark adaptation. You don't want flashes of light constricting their pupils and changing the biochemistry of their retina. Got it. So always shut your flashes off. So we've done temperature. We've done pinhole slash colander shadows. We've done sharp and fuzzy shadows. What is this? And now, So now we're doing sharp and fuzzy shadows again, but more precise. And, and this is just kind of a pet project for you, right? Yeah, I want to do this. So this is the rig I made up to take to Argentina. Oh, you're going to video it. Yeah, it's going to take a picture every minute. Oh, you should you should also have a, uh, you, could, you could put the circle in this too. You, you could, yeah. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. So now look at this. So what I'm going to do during the eclipse, one of these bars is going to be rotated so that it'll end up being in line with the crescent and one of the bars will be perpendicular. So you, we will see the in line one go from fuzzy to sharp as the eclipse progresses. And this is on a tracking mount, so it's gonna track the eclipse, okay? So it should be a smooth time lapse. What a great idea. What do you have over here? 
So we're going to monitor the wind at this eclipse. You know, you'll see a lot of articles on the internet before the eclipse that says the weather changed during the eclipse. Well, there are a lot of thermodynamic effects during the eclipse, but it doesn't really change, change the weather. But there is a very hard partial phase phenomena to witness, and that's an, an, an eclipse breeze. The theory behind it an is... An eclipse breeze? An eclipse breeze. Okay. If you have calm conditions at your observing site, and there are some mountains or hills in the distance, but relatively close, and they are in the direction of umbra approach, the ground there will cool before your ground at your observing site, just like we did at the temperature tower. And that cool air in those valleys will coalesce, roll down the valleys, and you'll feel it as a cool breeze coming from the direction of Umbra approach. It may not be the way you're looking at the eclipse, so you have to be aware of it coming from another direction, possibly. But it's not going to be a wind like... But, but it's like the function of the topography of the land around you correct. as well. Correct. That's exactly so like, right. So if there's a hill, like as the, the cooler air is more dense, right. it's going to roll downhill. That's right. And, and that's what you're going to try to capture here? That's right. So our observing site has a nice flat area, and it also has some hills to the east and the south. And so I'm going to have this pointing. This is a data logger. We'll have it pointing to those hills, and we'll see if we have calm conditions, if we can pick up a, a subtle eclipse breeze. Remember, it's subtle. Yeah, that's amazing. All right, so what is this? So this is the a station that talks about the creation and dissipation of convective clouds. On a clear day like this, if you get up in the morning and it's clear, and then by 11 o'clock or noon you see these little white fluffy clouds on a summer day, those are convective clouds. And they're created by the ground being warmed by the sun and creating moisture that rises as eddies. And these red arrows represent warm, moist eddies rising. And when that moisture hits the boundary layer, it condenses and it makes those fluffy clouds. But they are reliant on that continued energy of the sun and the continued supply of moisture. So the eclipse is going to shut off that energy and shut off that moisture. And those little fluffy convective clouds can actually dissipate before totality. Within 10 or 15 minutes before totality, there'll be these white puffy clouds in the sky and they'll start to go away. Wow. But not all clouds will go away, to be clear. So don't... Yeah, you, you, right. Yeah, the disclaimer. If you're at a place with clouds, like big clouds on eclipse day, get in your car, go down the path one way or the other to try to get away right. from the clouds. Big, right? big, thick, gray rain clouds are not reliant on this kind of energy. They're more of a weather front type clouds, and they won't have time to dissipate because of the decrease in the thermals. So you, you need to have a plan and a backup plan. And you should. Most people look at the the weather report the day before and try to figure out where to go. Yeah, try to go to a bubble of high pressure. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Okay, I don't, I don't know what to say about this other than this is definitely the cutest station here. <laughs> what is, <laughs> what is this? Come on over and show me. So, um, this is to teach people about the animal behavior. You know, can, we're, can you kneel down just a little bit? Yeah, sure. I think it'd be really cute. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. We're adults. Yep. And we're humans and we have brains and we know an eclipse is happening and we're watching it. We're in this field watching it because we know all about it. The animals don't know about it. They just think it's getting dark. So they think nighttime is coming. So they start their nighttime behaviors. It's fascinating. If you're, this is a, you know, a, a, a graph of the lux going down. And again, we won't even notice that anything's changing till about within, within 10 minutes or eight minutes of totality. Uh -huh. But the animals will sense it a little bit earlier. Really? So if you're in any natural environment at all, the first thing you'll hear is crickets. Crickets go crazy during the eclipse. Like this place, if this was in the path of totality, it would be wild. It would really? just be wild. About 10 or 15 minutes before totality, the crickets will start. The second thing that people are not aware of, and that's why I have the bird here, if you see a group of birds in the, in, in the 15 minutes before totality flying, like they look like they're going somewhere, that's probably not random. That's a behavior. They're going to their nighttime resting spot. So be aware of that. So a little group of birds doing something that looks like they're going in a direction, that's a behavior. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Bees are fascinating. Bees 
use the sun to navigate. That's how they get to their flowers. That's how they get back to their hive. It was studied a lot in 2017. People put video cameras up at the hives and before totality, the hives got very active because the bees were trying to get back to the hive before it got dark. Really? And they found that bees that couldn't make it back, if they were in some field and couldn't get back to the hive, they would land and they would wait for the sun to come back before they went to the hive or went to their flowers. So bees are really sensitive to these light changes and they change their behavior. So if you're a beekeeper, and you have bees and you're in the path of totality, put a video camera up at your hives and you'll be able to document that. Or if you're in a place with um, a flowery bush that the bees like love and they're buzzing around it, put a video camera on the flowery bush. It'll be really busy during the partial phases and when totality gets closer, the activity will go down. Really? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, I got one more animal over here. What the is chicken, this? The chicken. The chicken. This is to remind people that I have my chicken animal behavior video and, and people have to watch it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Where, where is that at? Uh, Solar Eclipse Timer is my YouTube channel. Okay. And so people can go watch the chicken video. The chicken on... video. Chicken behavior. It Do was... you explain it? I explain everything. It, it, it's amazing. I, I, I don't want to give it away. Okay. Uh, That's fine. It, it, it's amazing to see what chickens did before and after totality. Uh, I had a farmer in Nashville monitor their chicken coop for me. I mailed them a camera and a tripod and they sent it up and then I sent them a self-addressed stamped, you know, yeah. shipping label to mail it back to me. I and then I this. looked at the data and I couldn't believe it. Okay, okay, sounds great. So we're gonna look at animals during the eclipse. Our crickets are gonna come alive. We're gonna look for birds flying off to roost. We're gonna look at bees trying to go back to the hive and we're gonna watch Gordon's chicken video, okay? <laughs> I like it. What is this? This is uh... So this is the Purkinje effect. Um, our eyes have two types of cells in the retina that gather light to tell us what's going on. So the cones are the color sensitive um, cells and they absorb in blue, green, and red. Mm -hmm. And then our nighttime vision cells are the rods and they only, uh, only absorb in, in the greens, the blue greens. So cones take a lot of... I thought of, rods were like black and white sensors. Well, they're black and white because they only absorb in one wavelength. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and your, your brain can't process it to be a color. I see. Okay, so during an eclipse when that lux is falling, and you get down to this area about four minutes before the eclipse, the cones need a lot of photons to fire. They need a lot of energy to fire an impulse to the brain. So they start to struggle for photons. And so they start to shut down and your rods start to take over because they think it's getting to be nighttime, right? So they're battling and your brain is trying to sort it all out. So what happens is you're in this zone of vision called the mesopic zone of vision. Yes, yeah, so what happens is the cones are struggling to get photons to fire and the rods are starting to take over. So that's what creates that eerie, gray, silvery cast that happens. It right. almost makes you feel, you don't feel sick, but you feel- It's weird. Between that and the shadows, it gets very odd. So okay. what's up with the red and the, and the green card over there? Well, I, I need to do something. Okay. You know, this is way over the top. Okay. <laughs> but I'm gonna do it. Okay. All right, Gordon wants me to get this camera to show something, all right? So, what is this? So this has to do with the red and green cards, okay? Okay, what are we doing? I'm gonna show you. Okay, oh, where, man, do you, where do you need me? Is it just general? Just put, put your camera down. Put my camera down, okay. Yeah. Here we go, ready? Oh wait, hold on, wait, wait. <laughs> so I need, where do I need to be? Just the whole area. Okay, I'm ready. So I made up something for us because I, I, I want to emphasize this. Okay. I made, <laughs> I, I made up Perkinji effect shirts. Okay, great, great, great. All right, and it actually says Perkinji effect smarter every day. So okay, put great. that on. <laughs> Is this happening? This happened. <laughs> you cut and sewed these shirts. I had somebody do it. Yeah, I bought two shirts and I had them split it in half. Oh, I, oh, I, I am gonna wear this. You got my size right, Gordon. <laughs> All right. I'm so happy. All right. Okay. This is my This is my smarter everyday Perkinji effect shirt. How long have you been planning this? Uh about a month. Okay. All right. 
Are you going to wear this on Eclipse Day? Absolutely. <laughs> How's it look? <laughs> All right. Okay. Hold on. I got to get your microphone out. Hold on. Okay. So mine says Prakinji Effect Solar Eclipse Timer. Yep. <laughs> did you... Am I wearing half of the... Yeah, red? they're split. How did you decide which side got the buttons? Oh, well, you just had to choose. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know. I think... I thought the, the red on the green would look better than the green on the red. It would be easier to see, so that's why I gave you the red on the green. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm all in, Gordon. <laughs> all right. How do we look? I right. think we look good. Yeah, okay. Why are we wearing red and green shirts? We look like El the movie Elf. <laughs> what, are we, what does this have to do with an eclipse? Tell me so, about it. So here's the deal. In 2017, it was a summertime eclipse, right? It was August 21st, and we were in uh, Tennessee on this green field in, in this vineyard. And I saw the most amazing Purkinje effect, that gray, silvery, odd color, and the reds getting bland. It, I mean, it was just amazing. So go to Argentina in 2019, and I'm expecting to see the same thing. I'm looking for it, and I don't see it. It just was not there. It was not dramatic. So I get back, and I'm looking at my pictures, and something occurred to me. The Argentina eclipse was in the winter. We were in a gray field with no color. We had bland trees. Oh, no trees. We had bland trees behind us with no leaves. All of the people were wearing bland colors. There was no target. To see the Pekinji effect, you have to have colors. You have to have the target. Oh. If you don't have colors, your eyes don't have those colors to get bland. Oh, I see. You have to have a color. So it's good to wear colorful things on Eclipse Day because you your eyes are seeing the color and then you can see the change from exactly. the color. Exactly. Okay, that it. was the difference between 2017 and 2019. That's why when I give my lectures and when I talk about the Purkinje effect in, in my book, I tell people, tell all your friends and all your family to wear bright colors to Eclipse Day. Okay. Red and green, yellows, light blues, have it be a, this mix of bright colors. So during the eclipse, I can look at you and I can see your shirt is different than it was 30 minutes ago. Okay. You have to have target. So that's my thing for this eclipse. Everybody has to go to the eclipse wearing red and green. Okay. Interesting. So like a Christmas time eclipse feel. So <laughs> I need to get a different hat. Okay. <laughs> no, blue's okay. You blue's can okay. wear blue. Yeah. Okay. It, any color is great, but it's the reds that are going to get bland. You know, in a pure... Oh, because the light becomes red because of the, the no, sun. No, no, that's a different effect and I don't know how that affects the, that's just another thing that makes the lighting odd during an eclipse, but that's not the Purkinje effect. Okay. The Purkinje effect has to do with your cones not being able to fire and not being able to see the red okay. and your rods starting to take over in only one wavelength. Okay, so there's three types of vision. There's photopic, scotopic, which is the black and white at night, and, and the then there's sopic. the mesopic. Right. And so the photopic is what you're going to start the eclipse with, and you're Very going to move, bright. move towards the scotopic, but, but you're in, gonna, between, in between, you're going to have mesopic. You're going to end up in the mesopic zone, I see. Right. And so an eclipse is a perfect time to see that because there's another, no other alteration in color. So the only other time you can see this is like with a sunset or a sunrise, because the, it, things are getting dimmer, but that gets ruined by the colors of the horizon. It pollutes the effect. So a pure Purkinje effect is great during an eclipse because there's no other ambient color being introduced. Got it. And so in a perfect Purkinje effect, because the rods are absorbing in the blue-green, greens should actually get brighter. I've never seen that, but I'm going to look for it this year. The red should get blander and the green should get cleaner. Got it. So everybody has to wear red and green and we're going to wear our shirts so we have both. <laughs> you just dictated my, my wardrobe for the eclipse. <laughs> what, I want to wear blue. That's my color. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take my shirt off as we go to the final station here. You got it made, Gordon. Did you have a tailor do this or did you say yeah, No, I had a tailor do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. See how great, what a job she did on the collars? Yeah. It's perfect. It's amazing. So the last station, perhaps my favorite, shadow bands, or as I call them, shadow snakes. 
Do we understand what shadow snakes are at this point, Gordon? So there's the main theory is that when the sun becomes that little tiny slit of light within 90 seconds to 120 seconds before totality, it's no longer um, broad enough, it's not even banana shaped enough, that that slit can be perturbed by the atmosphere at some level. Now, some people say it's refraction, that there's layers of warm and cold air causing refraction of the light. Some people think it's kind of a wave front addition or subtraction. To be honest with you, those theories have to do with some of the theories of scintillation that, that we use for stars, uh -huh. but I actually don't believe that. I don't think that slit behaves like a point source. I think it behaves more like a planet, like what we would call atmospheric seeing. So I think shadow bands are actually caused lower in the atmosphere where moisture starts to pick up. I mean, that's my personal opinion. I, I can't prove that. So, so basically what shadow bands are, are if you have a white, or you know, just a, a light color background, right before totality, it looks like snakes are running all over the ground. That's, is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, very low contrast gray shadows. They're always in rows and they're little rectangles, although you might not perceive the rectangle because it is a representation of the slit in the sky. And they're in rows and they can move left to right. Sometimes they can look like they're leapfrogging, which gives the snake effect. It looks like boiling water. It looks like Except it's in rows. It's in it, rows. It has linearity to it. And that's what you have to look for. That helps you pick it up. So if you look at videos on the internet, it doesn't do it justice. Like you can't see it. You can only see this in totality, like yes. in the, the path of totality. And it's right before, and you'll just see, it looks like things are, what direction are they? Do we know? They're in line with the slit but depending on which way the atmosphere is perturbing them can make them move in any direction. Okay. It's, it's the wildest thing. It's hard to explain. There's this, just know that there's this thing that happens right near totality on both the front side and the back side right. called shadow bands, or as I call them, shadow snakes. I get really excited about it. And I, I've seen them once. I didn't see them in Argentina. I did see them in Wyoming. And it was, we saw it on a hay bale. Right. And, uh, but it's hard to capture with the camera because of the dynamic range of the sensors, but it's, you can see it with your eye. Right. And the other thing people have to realize, it's not a local effect. It's not happening where you're standing. It's happening where the sun is penetrating the atmosphere. It's happening somewhere. Coming to you. Yeah. The light. Yeah. Right. So eclipses that are right above your head would have short shadow bands. Eclipses that are really low, like I saw them in 2019 in Argentina, because it's such a low angle, the shadow bands are longer because they're penetrating the atmosphere way, way far away because of the triangulation. That's amazing. Where do you look? Where do these happen? Are they behind you? No. So that's, that's a great question. Um, so the slit in the sky is making them as that slit of light gets perturbed by the atmosphere. And everybody's gonna be really excited. I mean, it's 120 seconds before totality. The crescent is really, really thin. You have to force yourself to look down because if you're looking at the crescent and nobody accidentally sees them and tells you to look down, you'll miss them because you have to look to the ground. So just like if I'm looking at the sun right here, I'd literally look just right, right down on the ground. Right. Yeah, have a white sheet set up in front of your group so you can take peaks up and down. You don't have to look to the left, you don't have to look to the right because they're gonna happen very quickly. And they, during, before totality, they fade in very slowly. You have to take multiple looks because you're dark adapting and they're very low contrast. And then what happens, it, the, the slit gets so thin and the ambient lighting gets so dark that you can't see them again anymore because they lose contrast. After totality, they're even better because you're dark adapted and they pop on right after C3 and they're really dramatic. You're dark adapted and they pop on and then they fade away. So they're a little different before and after totality, but you have to concentrate on them and you have to look down. My app makes reminders at 90 seconds, 60 seconds and 30 seconds before C2 to look for shadow bands. That's where you look down. That's awesome. All right, Gordon, you've, uh, you've taken us through all this science of the partial phase phenomena. And what, what is your hope? Like, what was your hope in building all this stuff? To educate the public uh -huh. in, in general through my videos and your video um, in lectures 
and on the day of the eclipse for people in our field to physically enjoy it. Thank you for doing this. And you're welcome. Like, I really appreciate it. Uh, let me ask you this. Wh why do you love eclipses? The basic science. The basic science to watch stuff happen in real time. But how do you balance doing all this data with actually enjoying the event? Because I think what you can do, I found this in the first eclipse I went to, I got so excited about like setting up my camera this way or doing this or doing that. When it actually happened, my brain just left my body and I just enjoyed it. So yeah. how would you, what advice would you give people to balance the learning about what's happening and actually enjoying the event? You know, that's a good question. Look, everybody doesn't have to do this, but just doing a little portion of it will help you enjoy the event more. But part of my enjoyment of an eclipse is doing this stuff. So I can do this stuff and enjoy the eclipse too. And this is a four minute and 23 second eclipse for us. So we'll have time. You're saying this this partial phase phenomenon happens over the hour leading up yeah, to it. Yeah, you have an hour and a half to enjoy this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but then when it comes down to the moment of totality, then focus on that. What is your advice? Well, I'm a photographer, so you know, I want to photograph it. There's a lot of people that say if it's your first eclipse, you shouldn't try to take any pictures of it at all, but I don't agree. With a little bit of practice, a little bit of research, all of this is outlined in my book, chapter by chapter, all the, patial, the partial phase phenomena. And then the photography is outlined in my book. I, what I want, my goal for photography is I want some mom or dad who has a DSLR camera in their closet to be able to take a simple picture of the eclipse. And they can do it. They can take a great picture. It's not a big deal. I can teach them how to do it. That's great. All right. So this is why I love Gordon. He's a humble man. He's done a lot of things to try to help other people. You genuinely love eclipses. And you, I think more than the eclipse itself, you love other people loving eclipses. That's exactly right. Yeah. I love to share this. All right, so this is the app, Solar Eclipse Timer. It's hard to see because it's so bright out here. Download this. I'll leave a link down in the video description. And then you, basically, wherever you are located on Eclipse Day, you hit a button, it'll get your GPS position. And then you will do all the calculations in the app right. and you will tell people what to look out for at what time. It'll calculate their contact times in universal time. Then when they load it into the timers, it'll convert it to the local time. Right now, things are an hour off because we're not in uh, daylight saving time. So, but on Eclipse Day in April after March 10th, that hour will be corrected. And then it'll just talk them to the, the Eclipse. Just have them turn their phone on and listen to the announcements. Have you heard from thousands of people that love your app? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What does that make you feel? I love it. I love it. One of, one of my favorite things is seeing um, videos from 2017 where my app is running in the background. You can hear it. And there's like a dad with a video camera and my app will say, observe the horizon. And the dad will go, hey, hey guys, look at the horizon. Look at the horizon with this shaky video, but it's okay because he's telling his family to, you know, to rotate around and look at the colored horizon. I mean, that just warms my heart, man. Really? Yeah. Because so everybody's getting to an, enjoy the eclipse a little bit like you do. Well, because you might miss it. I mean, during shadow bands, a lot of people are looking up at that fine crescent. You have to force yourself to look down. So if, if some, somebody or something is not reminding you to do that, you'll miss it. Yeah. So that's what it's all about. Just trying to have people have a great experience. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gordon. Man, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for sharing your love of eclipses with me. I have turned into someone who, I think that's it. It's compelling. Like your love for it is compelling and that's why I love it and that's why I want other people to love it. So thank you for letting me show this. I, to be clear, I get nothing out of talking about Gordon's app. It's legitimately good. I just want you to go enjoy the eclipse as best you can and I think this is the way to do it. Uh, you don't have to do all the science that Gordon does, but it's fun to know. It's fun to know it, hit, right? Hit, hit the high points. Hit the high points. Hit the high points. If you had to pick one or two things, what would you recommend? Pinhole projection. Yeah. Make up a, a card with your, your name on it. Pinhole project your name and sharpen fuzzy shadows. Those are, that's the easiest yeah. to do. And then Purkinje effect, wear colored color clothes. That's really easy. Nothing to do. No math. And shadow bands. I mean, I think those would be the big four. Okay. The lighting effect. And the crickets are just going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let nature do its work. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Gordon. You're welcome. Thank I, you. I'm, I'm truly grateful. I really am.